it's so great to see everybody today. Anybody excited to be in church today? Come on, somebody. We don't need that hour of sleep. I feel the presence of God and the excitement of everybody. It's incredible. Welcome to everybody who's here today. And I just have to take a moment and reflect on the video we just saw. Uh, right here in this service, we have Pastor Layton, our youth pastor, and uh, Jesse just led worship for us a moment ago. And I say hello to Bubba out at the campus and really all the, the youth ministry at every campus, the team that leads all of our students. Can y'all put your hands together and honor them and what God is doing in our students? I'm so fired up. I'm so fired up to see it and to sense it. And I have four kids of my own. And I just see them growing in their walk with God. And I just don't ever want that to feel normal or take it for granted. Uh, that's an amazing thing. And I do want to say hello to all of our campuses across Alabama, over in the state of Georgia, everyone who's joining us online or later on, on demand. And of course, the, the men and women of the Alabama Correctional Facilities. I know I got you clapping a lot, but one more time, put your hands together for your church. We love you guys. Well, I am so fired up to be here today and excited for a new series. We're starting a brand new series uh, today, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment, but it really was birthed um, out of a vision, a, a word that God gave Pastor Chris, and I'm so grateful for our pastor, the way he leads us in faith and courageous faith each and every year. And back in December, he really heard God say that this would be, 2024, would be a year of miracles uh, that we would see in a world that is full of chaos and darkness and just so many other things happening around us that we would see here at Highlands, um, God doing miracles in our lives. And I'm just grateful for his vision, uh, grateful for his faith. And I'm, I'm thankful now, here we are a few months later and we're already seeing that. Um, just the stories, I'm gonna share more in a moment. The stories of God's faithfulness are amazing. If you wanna write down a definition, if you're like, hey, what is a miracle? Because that word, we use it a lot. What do we, what do we mean when we say that? It's when we, when we see God do something that only God can do. And if you wanna know what your church is praying for over your life right now, it's just that. Is that the, the situations you're facing, that we would see God do a work and we would say at the, on the other side of that, it was something that only God can do. And in fact, that's really what the word miracle means. It means to wonder at, to marvel, to be astonished. So at the end of all of, you know, whatever it is that God does, when you look at it, you're really not even excited about the thing. It's like you look at it and you say, only God. Only, you just marvel, only God could do this. And that's our heart uh, for this series. And so what we're going to do over the next four weeks leading up to Easter is we're going to study one of the miracles of Jesus each week. In fact, today we're going to study two of those miracles. And the Bible shows us in, in the Gospels there are about 37 recorded miracles of Jesus, although John 20 tells us there was many more than that that were not recorded. So our God is clearly a miracle working God. And we're just going to grab some of these miracles and we're going to study them I think you're gonna love it because you're gonna learn your Bible more and there's, there's just nothing like digging into God's word together. I love it. I love that we're gonna do that today. Uh, I really think it's gonna help us practically in our walk with God that, that as we walk through these miracles that God's gonna speak to you and I would pray you would open your heart up to that. Uh, but more than anything, boldly I'm saying right here at the very beginning, we're praying this series stirs your faith because <laughs> we're believing for a work of God in your life and we're believing for that in, 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 in every possible way. So we're believing for the small, like everyday miracles. Y'all do know that our God can do those. Like it's not just the big stuff. It can be the small everyday miracle. Anybody out there, we can, like, we can look to God. And oftentimes I think God is doing those all around us and we just don't have eyes to see. And maybe even during this series, it's just asking God, hey, show me where you're at work. Because when you, when you find him at work in your life, it will encourage you. I'll never forget kind of an everyday miracle for my wife, Jill and I. Uh, it was early on in our marriage. We were serving here at Highlands. And this is back in the day. This is 2005 of uh, where uh, we were at Mountain Brook High School. So the entire church was portable and we were a part of the, the setup and takedown team. And I had the honor uh, with Miss Robin Farrell, who's in this service. I saw her a moment ago of setting up Kids Church uh, at Highlands. And so we got there early. It was like a 4.30 call. And uh, here at Grants Mill, we don't know anything about that. Some of you campuses still know exactly what I'm talking about. And so the entire church was in a trailer and it was such an honor to be a part of, of setup. And then along the way, Jill and I really felt called to student ministry. And so we started serving uh, along with Pastor Lane and our student ministry. And we were, y'all, we were having the time of our lives just serving. I was actually a school, teaching school at that point. I was an elementary school teacher. Some people don't know that. So I taught special needs students, uh, first through third grade uh, at a school up in the Adamsville area. And just, we were loving being part of our church and we just loved what God was doing and wanted to be a part of all of it. And we found out that in, in 2006, there was a, a mission trip going to Germany. And Jill and I just felt called to go on that trip. It was with our students. 
Uh, the problem was this, we were early married. I was actually still in grad school while I was teaching and we had no money and the mission trip was like $3,000 and it might as well have been a million dollars. Come on, early married couples, you know what I'm talking about. It was like, oh my goodness, but we had faith for it. And so we prayed, we started saving, you know, we got rid of as many bills as we could and we we're like, hey, how can we get there? But um, honestly, we were getting some traction and even a few people had given us, uh, kind of donated to it, which was awesome. But the payment deadline was coming up and we were nowhere close to it. And I remember being so discouraged, but at the same time having that thing inside of me that was like, no, God called us to do this. And so one morning I come out of setup at, at Highlands. So this was like six o'clock in the morning and I go to my Jeep and there's an envelope sitting in my Jeep. And it actually scared me at first because the envelope had, have you ever seen one of those movies where like a serial killer cuts out like magazine? <laughs> so this is mess, whoever it was, they cut, like put my name on it and like, oh my goodness, Jill has been kidnapped. That's what I thought. Where's my wife? You know, I'm about to go like Leah Nielsen in uh, Taken. I'm about to go Taken, which is, I kind of always wanted to, you know, whatever. So I'm getting geared up for that, but I open it up and y'all, this is, this is a miracle for us. It was a miracle. The exact amount of money we needed to go on that trip. Now, some of y'all out there may say, well, you obviously, you know, someone just knew. We had never told anyone to the penny it was the exact amount we needed. And I just pray over your life, small miracles in ways that maybe only you understand fully but that God just some, does something in your life. Anybody believe God can do those everyday miracles? Come on, put your hands together. We're believing for that. Hey, but boldly at the very beginning of this service, we're also believing for the big life-changing miracles, the impossible mountains to be moved. And I have a story just to stir your fate today from our Montgomery campus about a man named Lance, who was actually, he was, he was driving in his car when he suffered a heart attack which called their, caused him to have a, a, a car crash. He's a 50-year-old man who serves as a part of our Montgomery campus. And this is where the miracle starts. So he's in the, pretty much a, a, the worst possible situation, but a, a, an off-duty medic just coincidentally happened to be three cars behind. So immediately he's able to start working on him. They load him in the ambulance. Later on, when they check his pacemaker, uh, his, his heart, he was in cardiac arrest for 38 minutes. His heart was not working for 38 minutes. He gets to the hospital. Uh, he was clinically declared brain dead and they put him on life support machines. So his, now they start encouraging the family in the, in the first day or so, you know, to start thinking about decisions that have to be made. And all this is happening when their small group, Lance's and his wife Vicky's small group leaders come to the hospital. And I just love the fact that this is a, a small group moment because small groups are such an important part of our church. So this couple, Travis and Alicia, they come, they're the small group leaders to visit Lance and Vicki. And when they get there, they just feel led to pray. And this is what, this is what uh, Alicia said. She said, we could sense the presence of God. Together, we just gathered around him and we rebuked death. We prayed for life. It even prayed for the presence of God to be so real that it would impact the people who were passing by in the hallways. The second I said in Jesus' name, Lance's eyes opened and he looked directly at me. <laughs> Come on, somebody. This is amazing. And it, if we had time, I mean, we could tell the whole story, but the bottom line is this. The nurses kind of come in the room as you would expect. Everybody's kind of rushing and they start talking to Lance and, and the nurses immediately realize it's a miracle because they said, you know, he's tracking, his eyes were actually tracking with them. Just a couple of days later, everybody, he walks out of that hospital <laughs> completely healed. I actually have a picture for you. Now he's still serving on our dream team. There he is on the left-hand side right now. Yeah, put your hands together for the work of God. All right, so big or small, we're believing for miracles. And so we're gonna jump into it. And here's our hope. At the, at the end of the series, Easter, which is the greatest miracle of all, the bottom line is this, that we would all not even be marveling at the miracle, but at God. Only God, God doing things that only he can do. Uh, so I wanna jump in today with this first talk. And I think this is actually very foundational for the rest of the series as we jump in. Because immediately, I, and I feel this, and I, as I was praying for today, I feel this. I feel this in this moment right here that the moment we start talking about miracles, there's always gonna be a tension in the air. And I wanna pull this tension out of a scripture in Mark chapter nine. If you have your Bibles, we're gonna look first at chapter, or Mark 9, 23. And I won't tell the whole story here. This is actually in the middle of a miracle where a man has brought his son to Jesus to heal them. And the end of the, the, the man's last statement before this verse in verse 22 is, you know, if you can heal him. And this is what Jesus says back, verse 23. He says, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. And I would love you to underline that. And I wanna talk about the tension that is inherent in this verse, which is something I know for sure we all feel. Now on the front end of that, you have that everything is possible. And we've already talked about this today, but I just wanna say one more time, we believe that we serve an everything is possible God. With humans, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible, the word says. 
So we have a faith and a confidence that even if we're facing something right now that does not look like there is any way through it, that our God has a way of finding a way through it. So if you're out there today believing for a miracle in your family, in your marriage, in your finances, relationships, if you have a miracle in your heart for your kids or even believing for kids out there today, you again have a church who's gonna stand next to you and believe with God, with you, for that miracle. We believe what this word says, the, the word says, everything is possible. But the tension, and let's just be really honest today, the tension's in the last part of that verse. That is the for one who believes. Because I think it's just, obviously it's human nature because we immediately feel it. That when we face the impossible, we face situations that we can't fix, we can't control, it's very hard for us to believe and especially hard for us to keep believing. Can we be honest today in church? When we see that mountain, it looks immovable. <laughs> so our reaction is we wanna believe, we, we know what God's word says, but oftentimes it's, it's a struggle. We try to believe. We, we, it, it gets a lot harder when we, what we're praying for, we don't see it immediately. You know, you had a lot of faith back in 21 days, come on at 6 a.m., we're praying for it, we're believing for it. Now we are a few months later. Maybe you haven't seen that miracle yet and it's a lot harder to believe. And hey, this is the hardest zone to believe in. And that's when we don't see God do what we expected him to do. And we feel like we didn't get the miracle that we expected from God. Believing can be like a roller coaster. It's like, I'm, I know a lot of people are Disney fans. I'm more of a Six Flags guy. You know what I'm talking about? Just get over to Atlanta, get that frozen lemonade and go for it, right? And so, you know that, I hate this ride. You know that ride, Acrophobia? Oh, come on, let's be honest, our faith can feel like that. At times, it's a courage of faith. We're up at the top and then the bottom just falls out. <laughs> And then what is worse about that ride is not just one fall, like the old free fall. It's like up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's just, that's, that's, that's real. That's, that's, that's the human condition when we're facing impossible things. We believe God, and then there's a day where we really struggle to believe God. So here's what I wanna talk about today, and the miracles we're gonna study are gonna build our faith. I, I really believe this. I'm so passionate about this, because I know a lot of us are right here in this moment. And that is, how do we keep believing? Because we want to, but how do we keep believing in the middle of the impossible? When we're waiting for God to do that work. We're in, when we're in between our prayer and the miracle, how do we keep believing? To study, the, to, to, to build faith on this, I want us to study Mark chapter four and five. And I said this earlier, we're gonna get a two for today, all right? So two miracles for the price of one, all right? And what's cool is these miracles actually happen in the same day. And I, I won't read all of it, but starting in chapter four, if you wanna go read it, Jesus is having a day of teaching. This is kind of in the middle of his ministry, his three years of ministry. And this is the moment where the crowds were coming, Later on, we see the crowds leave, but this is the moment where Jesus is the latest up and coming thing. Everybody wants to be around him. He had done the Sermon on the Mount a few months back, and now he's teaching by the Sea of Galilee. The crowd is so big that he has to get into a boat to teach. He teaches all day long. You know he has to be exhausted, uh, but the day's not over yet. In fact, I'm sure the disciples thought it was over, but then Jesus says at the end of the day, hey, we're gonna go across the lake. We're gonna go across the Sea of Galilee. And that's where we're gonna catch up uh, in the story. They're going across this lake, and in the middle of the lake, a furious, the Bible says a furious squall or a storm blows up. And verse 38 says, Jesus was in the stern, in the middle of that storm, sleeping on a cushion. I feel like kind of here, Mark is calling Jesus out by the like side note right here. Like obviously he's saying Jesus is a heavy sleeper. Uh, in my family, I'm the heavy sleeper. Any heavy sleepers out there? Like you can't get woke up for nothing. Okay, I might be the only one in the room. That's great. A couple, Jason, thank you very much. Honest to God, in my house, Jill wakes up for anything. Our house could be being robbed and I am not gonna wake up. Someone could steal our bed and I would just be laying on the floor, all right? That's Jesus. I just feel like I'm like Jesus in that situation. So he's a heavy sleeper. He's asleep on the cushion. It says, the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He gets up, rebukes the wind and the waves, says, quiet, be still. The wind dies down. It's completely calm. And he says to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And we'll come back and teach this in a moment, but I just, I have to reflect on the fact that I am so grateful that our Bible is so transparent, real, and honest. Because the very thing many of us feel, they're feeling right here. Jesus, don't you care? Don't you see what we're going through? Don't you feel the pain that we're going through? And I love that Jesus steps into that moment he performs this miracle, and then we're gonna unpack it later on. He teaches them a very valuable lesson right there in their moment. He, he does, he's not rebuking them for feeling the way he's feeling. He's helping them out of it. We'll show you that in a moment. And then it says they were terrified. They asked each other after this miracle, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They are left marveling at God. 
chapter five, same day, same journey. They go across the lake. And it says they reach the region of the Gerasenes. And there's a lot we could talk about here, but this is an interesting location. Uh, none of the disciples would have likely ever been to this location because it was a Gentile region. This was an area that no proper Jewish person would ever go. It, was a very, it would be known for its depravity, its darkness. So this is not just any location. They have gone across the lake in their exhaustion through a storm to pretty much, for the, at least for the disciples, the worst possible place they could land uh, this boat. And it gets even worse because it says when they got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit or a demoniac came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot. So obviously he's a violent person. He's dealing with this demonic spirit. He's being attacked spiritually and that's resulted in a lot of struggles and a violence. And they've tried to chain him, but he tears the chains apart. He breaks the irons at his feet. It says no one was strong enough to subdue him. So they exiled him. And now he's living out in these tombs. It says day and night, he's in the tombs. He cries out. So he's in all this pain and agony, this isolation and even self-harm. He's cutting himself uh, with stones. And so before we go any further, you know, this is an opportunity for a huge miracle. I mean, the storm is usually what gets the attention because it's, it's loud and the wind is blowing. But can I tell you, there's another storm and this one's not on the outside, it's on the inside. It's a storm on the inside of this man. And it's just in some ways even a bigger opportunity uh, for a miracle. And I think we have to also acknowledge, y'all, the disciples are gonna need prayer. In fact, they're gonna need therapy, all right? So this is, for them, it's going from bad to worse. They're breaking all kinds of Jewish laws and customs. And this is, this is a day where they're probably just looking for a safe place. So here we are in, in verse six. It says, when Jesus saw from a distance, or when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran, he fell on his knees in front of him, and he shouts at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high? Very interesting. Most people were trying to figure out who Jesus was. Rabbi, teacher, Messiah. Come on, the demons already knew. <laughs> James 2 says they know and they tremble. That's the reaction the demon is having to him. For Jesus had said, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asks him, what is your name? He says, my name is Legion, which Legion was a Roman term for 6,000. We don't know if he had 6,000 demons, but it, he had a lot. So this man's been attacked. It says, uh, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send, him, send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. Verse 13, here's the miracle. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. And the herd of about 2,000 in number rushed down a steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Couple things, why pigs? We could spend all day. I, and honestly, I've studied, I have no idea why God chose pigs. I do know this though, that is where deviled ham came from, right there in God's <laughs> words. This is the worst preacher's joke ever, all right? Bottom line is this, when God shows up, nothing is impossible. If you're in the middle of impossible right now, I wanna encourage you today to stand on the four truths we see in this scripture. Write the first one down. If we're gonna make it through the impossible, if we're gonna keep believing, number one, we gotta make Jesus the object of our faith. Make Jesus the object of our faith. I am not James Spann, but I'm gonna play his part for just a moment, all right? Here's a, here's a weather prediction. In life, you're either heading into a storm, going through a storm, or coming out of a storm. So I'm grateful that this first miracle we read has the context of a storm because that truly is like the human condition. And the thing about life, and, John, and God tells us in his word that, that it's, it's not like one storm, it's, it's a journey of storms. You're gonna go through storms. In this world, we're gonna have trouble. We're gonna continually walk through these storms. And that is, it's, if we're not aware of it or understand it or we don't have faith, it is going to be so defeating. Uh, in our neighborhood, we, have a, we live in an older neighborhood. Uh, our house is about 100 years old. And so the, the, the trees around it, are, they're very mature because it's, it's, it's an old neighborhood. And so unfortunately, a lot of times when we have storms, some of the trees will fall. In fact, we had a tree hit our house a, a few years back. Um, but about three years ago, we have a neighbor move in two doors down and they move into their home. They'd only been there for a few days. We had actually had not even uh, really met them. We'd waved at them. We hadn't even had a chance to meet them yet. And uh, one night, a massive storm blows through. And I did not wake up because I told you I'm a heavy sleeper, but I wake up to my wife waking me up. And she's shaking and she's like, I just heard this really loud noise. We run outside everybody and this tree has cut this house, the neighbor's house in half. And it's raining, there's power lines, like gets the whole scene. We don't know if they're in there and we are, we are obviously praying, kind of freaking out. We get their phone number from another neighbor. We're calling them, we're trying to figure out, call, you know, call the fire department, all of that. Luckily, thank God they're not in the house. But then I have the awkward situation. I'm like, hey, my name is Mark. I live two doors down and your house is destroyed. Welcome to the neighborhood. You know, that's, that's, that's my first interaction with them. Well, they fixed this house. 
It takes about a year to fix it. They move back in. They've been in for three days and one night another storm hits. And Jill, once again, I wake up to Jill shaking me. She's like, I just heard something. I'm like, oh my goodness. We walk outside and the front of their house had been hit first. Now the back of their house has been hit. The same house, everybody. They've lived in this house a total of seven days overall, over to a year and a half. We're, we're freaking out again. We're like, oh my goodness, are they in the house? Now, you know, we have their number. We call them. I'm like, hey, I know this is crazy, but it's Mark again. And I have to tell you, your house has been hit by a tree. And there was an initial shock. And then she actually said the words to me, please never call me again. <laughs> don't ever call me again. Like, I, praise God, don't ever call me again. So, but hey, it's, and they're, they're doing great. Thank God for insurance. They're gonna make it through. Thank God no one's hurt. But hey, feel, it, can, it can literally feel like that in life. Tree after tree, moment after moment. moment. And that's what the disciples, I mean, their day is that. Their day is like, it, they're going through all these different contexts of storms. And when we're facing those storms, it's, it's so easy to feel just like they did. In verse 38, it says, the disciples woke Jesus and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, here's the deal. They know that Jesus cares. They know that. So do we. They had seen Jesus do miracles over the last two years. They knew he could take care of anything. They, they knew that Jesus cared. And that's why I believe Jesus confronts him the way that he does. In verse 40, it says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And that sounds harsh to us. But another way to translate that is this. Where did you put your faith? What Jesus is saying is, you have misplaced your faith. You've gotten so distracted by the storm, and check this out, you've even gotten distracted by the miracle you're looking for. You've missed out on the real miracle. Here's the revelation. Jesus is in the boat. They had nothing to fear. The real miracle isn't the miracle, it's the fact that God is in the boat. Hey everybody, we aren't a church that believes in miracles, we're a church that believes in the God of miracles. He is the object of our faith. And if we're not careful, come on, you can clap, let's clap, because it's, it's a powerful truth. If we're not careful, and I have done this, I am notorious for this, we will make faith into a work. Because we'll try so hard to get that miracle, we'll forget the fact, we're not believing in the miracle, we're believing in the God of miracles. Write it down, the object of our attention isn't the miracle when we're going through the impossible, the object is the God of the miracles. Jesus is in the boat. And we believe the miracle is coming, but in the meantime, can I just open your heart up to a deep truth that you have access to a, I think, even greater miracle right now in the middle of your impossible situation. John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you're gonna have trouble. Storms are coming, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In the middle of your storm, in the middle of the impossible, as God works it out, as only he can, even when it doesn't look exactly like you think or come in the time you expect. All along the way, as followers of God, we have access to peace. Philippians 4 says it's a transcending supernatural peace. How do we receive it? We make Jesus and his word the object of our faith. I would encourage you, if you're facing the impossible right now, and if I was to ask you, I guarantee almost every one of us would raise our hand in our life or someone else's. So this, this is for everybody today. Get a verse to stand on in the impossible that keeps your attention on Jesus, allows his peace to fill your heart so that he's the object of your faith. Y'all receive that, everybody? Come on. It's a powerful truth. Here's number two. And this is, a, this is a good one too. And that is that in the middle of the impossible, we gotta trust Jesus loves us more than we can imagine. And I love the fact that Jesus starts today teaching a crowd. But come on, somebody. He leaves the crowd to go to the one. And in fact, we'll read at the very end of the message today, there was only one man he went to minister to that day. Praise God for the crowd. But Jesus crossed that lake. Jesus went through that storm. He stepped into the darkness, not for a crowd, but for one guy. And that tells us beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves us and he is willing to do anything for us. Jesus had three years of public ministry. It's like 156 months roughly 1,095 days. And he took one of those days for this guy that no one else would have spent the time of day on. I believe he did it to demonstrate, to mark our hearts, everyone in every service and in my heart, especially the men and women of the Alabama Correctional Facilities. You just gotta know today, God loves you, case settled, case closed. He loves you. You gotta trust that he loves you, especially when you're going through a situation because all of hell comes against us in the impossible and the enemy wants us to doubt God's love so that we'll take our situation out of God's hands 
and we'll take it back into our hands. If we doubt God's love, then we'll doubt his power and his strength. And the enemy would love us to take that situation uh, back in our own hands. And I pray that this story reminds us forever and for always, point, if God can do it in the Gerasene man, if he loves him, if he, God loves the Gerasene man, he loves you. I think that's why we have the example of this guy right here. I, I don't travel a lot just with, in the season with raising kids and, and uh, Highlands College, but this past week I got a chance to go to a church in Minnesota, uh, which was, uh, that's, that's a whole different thing right there, Minnesota. But anyway, so um, like I got off the airplane, they were looking for my passport. I'm like, I'm from Alabama, not another country. Anyway, so, but it's an ark church. It's actually the 15th church that we all planted. And if you're here today, maybe you're new, we are a part of an amazing organization called ARC. We plant churches. And, and because of your generosity, churches like this, now well over a thousand have been planted. And today in Minnesota, there'll be thousands of people worshiping God in that church. And you're a part of that. Uh, but I, share, I shared on stage, it was their first Wednesday. At the end, I came in the front and I was hanging out, talking to some people. And this one guy came up to me and he was like, I could see in his eyes, he was so confused. He's like, can you, he was new to their church. He's like, can you explain what you're talking about at this church? I'm like, yeah, Church of the Highlands, you know, we 26 locations. He's like, 26 locations, multiple states, and y'all have a college? And he literally said these words. He goes, all of that in Alabama? I'm like, yeah, come on, sweet home Alabama. Come on, we're building people's faith. If God can do it in Alabama, he can do it anywhere. I'm okay with that. I'm okay. I'll, well, let's own that, everybody, all right? So listen, God loves you. And let's not take the situations we're facing out of his hands. That would be the worst mistake we can make. Here's a great verse, 1 Peter 5, 7. says, to cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And I feel this so deep in my heart today. As I was praying for this talk, this is the moment I felt like God would do something big in someone's life. Because maybe it's because you doubted God's love or maybe you've been disappointed in the past because God, you feel like God didn't come through for you. And every temptation, every natural instinct is to hold on to it. I got just, and I wrote it down in my journal a few days ago, a word from God for you, and that is let go of control. It's time. It's been in your hands for too long. That, that word cast in, in, in that, that verse we just read, it can be a little confusing because when we hear it, we may think of fishing. And when you fish, you throw something and you reel it back. But in the original language, it's actually the word hurl. It's, it's like, get it off of me. I'll, I, I release all control. It's as far away from me and as close to God as it can be. And that's a beautiful opportunity for us today. And I would just challenge you, if God's speaking to you, if you have an impossible situation and you're wanting to believe in the middle of it, you have that connection card, you can write it down and, and we'll pray for you. But can I just challenge you at every location? I don't know if you know this, but at the end of each service, we have a prayer team down front. I know this may be, this may be different for some of you, but I would just challenge you before this serve or when the service ends, before you leave, to step out of your seat and come forward and let someone agree with you in that situation. They'll, they'll even have anointing oil. They can pray for you or pray for someone else in your life. Don't leave here with any part of the enemy's attack still at play where he's trying to make you doubt God and hold on to whatever it is you're going through. Come on, everybody, let's cast. Let's cast it on God. And when it's there, it's in the perfect place. Here's number three. And this one's so good as well. That is to remember, Jesus's power was proven on the cross. His power was proven on the cross. You know, the demoniac was shackled. Even though he broke his physical chains, he was still shackled physically at times, but always in, in his life and whatever had happened, we don't know. But there was an emotional you know, bondage. There was definitely a spiritual bondage. But with just a few words and a bunch of pigs, Jesus broke all of that off of his life. Mark 5, 15 shows us God's power. It says when, when, when all that had happened, the pigs had run into the water, the whole town hears about it. They come running out. It says when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind and they were afraid. And I mean, this is, I know we read it and we've read it maybe in Sunday school. It was on the felt board and we gotta be so careful that, I mean, that, that is a marvel moment. Like this guy was as, was as lost and as shackled as you can be and God rescues him and now the Bible says he's sitting at the feet of the Messiah. For a Jewish person, that would have been represent intimacy and presence and closeness. Like this is a massive miracle. 
He's sitting there. The question is, how would God have the power to do that in his life and in our life? And here's what we know. Come on, look at the end of Jesus' life here on earth. How does he have the power? He went to a cross and he took the very same wounds upon himself that this demoniac had in himself. He was isolated on that cross. He was wounded on that cross. He was stripped naked on that cross. He was pushed away in every possible wound. And Isaiah 53 says he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. How does he have the power? He paid for it on the cross. Come on church, how do we believe in the impossible? Because God did the unthinkable. He took my place. He took your place, he took my place. His, his power was proven on the cross. And we stand firm in that. When we get saved and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Savior, we have access, Romans 8 says, to that very same power. And you say, well, I don't feel powerful. We're not. The Bible says where we're weak, he is strong. And when we receive him inside, we're able to experience his power. How does God do it? I don't know. Sometimes he uses pigs. Sometimes it's calming of a storm. It's never gonna look the same. All I know is this. He paid a price on the cross and he came out of a grave so that he would have the ability to step right into our situations. He paid a price so that we could experience his healing. And we can have confidence today. Come on, that is the faith, that all, that is the confidence that all of our faith is built on. As, as followers of Jesus, it is all about what he did on Calvary. So you're believing for the impossible? Come on, the impossible has already happened. So we look to the cross and we say, if he did it there, then I have that same power. I'm gonna trust his power is at work. And we're gonna finish today out for anyone who's never received Jesus as we always do here at Highlands. This past service, I mean, the service before this, people gave their heart to Jesus. We're gonna give you that same chance. There'd be no bigger miracle in your life than I was lost and now I am found. For all of us who have followed God for many years, come on, let's never let the cross become common. Let's never let it just be something we forget. We stand on that in confidence. We trust God's power. And here's the last one we're gonna pray together. And that is to know Jesus gives purpose to it all. That he gives purpose to it all. Mark 5, 18 through 20. So this is the end of that, of that miracle. It says, when Jesus is getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. This is interesting, but Jesus did not let him go. So many of the disciples had had a situation like this. They had asked to go with him and Jesus said, yes. But in this case, Jesus says, no. He says, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the people in the Decapolis, which is just a group of 10 cities, all pretty much in the same circumstance as the Gerasenes. These are completely lost people. He says, go tell the Decapolis how much Jesus has done for you. And all the people marveled. They were in awe and wonder. The day starts with this guy all the shackles we just talked about, as lost as can be without any hope. Come on, this, this is gonna stir faith in somebody. Maybe you feel like that's you in your own circumstance. You're like, I'm as far away from anything good happening in my life. It was 24 hours later. This man is being sent out as the very first Christian missionary. <laughs> Our God is a miracle working God. And what is he being sent out with? He's not being sent out as some preacher and turn or burn or whatever. No, he's being sent out with a story, a testimony. That in the middle of my impossible, when there was no hope, this man, Jesus, he stepped in and he rescued me with his grace and with his mercy. And I don't know how, but he did it. And now here I am. I am clothed and I am unshackled and I have purpose and I have calling. It's the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony that breaks the darkness with the light of God and our world. Come on, everybody, our world needs it. They don't need another sermon. They need the testimony. That's why I believe with all my heart, this is the year of miracles. That God needs the testimony. And so let's not be shy with sharing it. Check this out. Even when you're in the middle of it, you have a story to tell. I'm trusting God for this. Oh, how are you walking through that circumstance? How are you dealing with that grief? How, how, how? how? I don't know how, I just know that God... <laughs> Did he cause it? No, let's get our theology right. He did not cause it. We live in a world that is broken. Power of the sin has, has broken this world. That's the power that is active, but through the grace and the mercy of Jesus, he will redeem it. What the enemy meant for harm, God will use for good. And what I'm about to say is not a commercial for the dream team, although you should be on the dream team. But the dream team was never meant to function like as a sun. It's not about, Sundays is amazing. We get to do something together, which is powerful. But you guys live the rest of your week 
out in the world. And hopefully the dream team was meant to, let's do something great together, but then we were sent out as dream teamers every day with a purpose and a calling to make an impact in the world we're around. And I just sense in my heart that there's some of us that already have a testimony that maybe we haven't been as bold as we could to share it. I believe with this message can inspire all of us. Let's go out there and start telling the world what our God has done. And if you're in the middle of the impossible, just know this, you have a story to tell. I love the fact that we have attention in our heart that the Bible speaks directly to. How do we keep believing in the middle of the impossible? Come on, make Jesus the object of your faith. Trust that he loves you. Let his power be firm in your heart. You just gotta know his power has already been proven. And let's let God give it purpose. Amen, everybody. Come on, put your hands together and celebrate that truth of God, his word today. All right, let's, let's pray together. Uh, heads bowed, eyes clo- closed, every location. It's a holy moment. And um, I mentioned earlier the moment of salvation. This is kind of that moment in our services. And whether you're here or online, just would ask you to be in just a prayerful state and just to open your heart up. I believe God's word has already been opening hearts up. And we're gonna pray for the specific miracles we're looking to or the impossible situations in a moment. But I do wanna start with this because this is the greatest miracle. You're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You, you may have been religious in your past or you may have been around church, but you've never really had that relationship. And if that's you, here's the bottom line, you know it. And I wanna give you a chance, I'm not gonna call you to the front or embarrass you, but give you a chance to respond today and to invite Jesus into your heart and to experience him as a Lord and a savior to know him personally. Like I said, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. But if you know that's you, I believe God's already speaking. I just wanna give you a chance to respond on the count of three at every location. I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hands and we're gonna pray together. If that's you, be bold today. One, two, three. Come on, raise your hands if that's you. Amen, awesome, I see that hand, I see that hand. Great, awesome, I see that hand. Praise God. Anyone else, anywhere around the room? I see that hand, awesome, right there. Awesome, great job, great job, amazing. You can put your hands down and let's pray together. Just whisper this or even pray it in your heart. Jesus, today I give you my life. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent and I turn away from that directly to you. Today I make you my Lord. You're in control. I receive you as my Savior. God, come in. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live my life for you. God, right now I pray for anyone who just made that declaration. Your word is so clear that the old is gone, the new has come. They are a new creation, a city on a hill. God, you have a purpose and a calling for them and they will spend eternity with you. So God, I just pray peace over them as they walk out these doors that they would immediately see the mission field and opportunity they have to share the testimony of your goodness with the world around them. Final prayer of the day. If you're out there today believing for the impossible, this is a moment. And I would actually still encourage you to come down afterwards to the prayer team. But that kind of even begins in this moment. This is our chance just to cast our cares on him. So God, right now, myself included, we have a lot of things that look impossible. We confess to you today that we have or at least are tempted to take control of these things. But as people of faith today with our eyes on Jesus, we right now, come on church, we hurl them onto you. We cast them onto you. God, we can't fix it. We know only you can. So we trust you with it. We let go of control. And God, thank you that right now in Jesus' name, we're receiving your peace, the peace that transcends understanding. God, thank you for that gift. We trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Come on, put your hands together and celebrate all that God's done.